Thanks. Nice, perfect. Well, good morning all and welcome to the gender diversity session. Welcome to a joint GLO and journal of population economic session. Thank you for investing your time with us on a Friday morning. My name is Nick and I'm chairing this session. Thank you very much, Klaus. Thank you very much for your participation. We have organized a most interesting session and we have insightful presentation. The context is very rich. We have five presentations today. Our first presenter, Mar Marina from the University of Zaragoza in Spain will present a study examining the effect of same-sex marriage uh, legalization on interstate migration in the USA. Then Doris from the University of Leeds in Austria will present a survey evaluating uh, labor market discrimination due to sexual orientation. The third presenter is Katerina from Anglia Ruskin University in the UK. Katerina will present a study on gender identity minorities and workplace legislation in Europe. Then the fourth presenter is Evangelos from the University of Oulu in Finland. Evangelos will present a study on sexual identity and gender gaps in leadership. Then I will present a meta-analysis on sexual orientation and earnings. And at the end of the session, I will provide some brief remarks regarding the gender section in the Springer Nature Handbook of Labor, Human Resources and Population Economics edited by Klaus. Its presentation should last approximately 15 minutes and we will have five additional minutes for a q and a We are ready to start. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for your time. Uh, Klaus, thank you very much for this great conference. Marina, the floor is yours and you can share your screen. Uh, my name is Marina Morales and today I'm going to present this paper entitled The Effect of Same-Sex Marriage Legalization on Interstate Migration in the US, which is being published in the Journal of Population Economics in 2022. And my co-author is Miriam Marcen and we are both from the University of Zaragoza in Spain. So, the location choice of homosexuals has been previously analyzed in the economic literature, and most of these papers suggest that the geographical distribution of homosexuals depends on their access to a many. I, so I was saying, uh, the first state introducing um, same-sex marriage in the U.S. was uh, Massachusetts in the year 2003. And after that, there was a progressive increase in the number of states allowing same-sex marriage until 2015, when uh, the, the law was introduced in the whole country. So in this paper, we ask uh, whether uh, the existence of these differences in the timing of the introduction of the law across U.S. states may have an effect on the migratory behavior of homosexuals between states. If we look at this figure, um, the green line shows the total number of homosexuals moving between states, and the blue line shows um, those moving to states allowing same-sex marriage, and the red one shows the um, homosexuals moving to states not allowing same-sex marriage. And what we can see here is that after 2006, more or less, there was a decrease in the number of those moving to states not allowing same-sex marriage. And at the same time, there was an increase in the number of those moving to states allowing same-sex marriage. Uh, so this was after um, the introduction of the law in Massachusetts. So uh, it is possible that Massachusetts was already capturing um, homosexuals. And the other thing we can see here is that the total number of homosexuals moving between states in the green line um, uh, decreases at the end of the period. So um, this may be because at the end of the period, the, the, the law was already introduced in, in all states. So homosexuals may be less likely to, to move between states. Why is marriage important? Uh, well, marriage uh, gives more benefits than other forms of partnership, like tax benefits, um, healthcare benefits, or even parental rights. 
Uh, there is also this paper in 2020 showing that uh, the legal protection of marriage is more important in homosexual decisions than other uh, non-discriminatory laws. Um, uh, the other thing is ma that marriage gives recognition and support. So from a theoretical point of view, uh, it would be possible that those states allowing same-sex marriage uh, could be capturing um, those homosexuals who prefer uh, living in marriage than remaining single from other states. What we do here, as I said before, is to exploit the differences in the timing of the introduction of the law across US states. So using the microdata from the American Community Survey for the the year 2001 to 2015, um, which provides information on the state of residence during the previous year, we calculate the percentage of homosexuals moving between states. Um, one data limitation is that the, the, we are only able to identify homosexuals as those living in, uh, in, a in the household with a same-sex partner. But this is something common in the literature. So what we do is to merge these percentages at the state level with the legislative history of same-sex marriage legalization across the US. And we analyze the effect of same-sex marriage legalization on the migratory behavior of homosexuals between states. Um, as during this period, uh, there was also other legal changes affecting homosexuals. Uh, we also control for other these um, legal changes. Uh, we also control for distant related costs. Um, we uh, explore the effect on the stock of homosexuals, not only on the migration flow. And finally, we also study whether this um, same-sex marriage legalization may push other individuals to leave a state allowing same-sex marriage. With our paper, we contribute to the literature on the migration behavior of homosexuals, which is quite discussed. Um, there is this paper in 2017 um, showing that individuals in both different and same-sex relationships are more likely to leave states not allowing same-sex marriage. And we also contribute to this uh, literature on the effect of same-sex marriage on different socioeconomic and demographic variables such as healthcare use, uh, labor supply, or even homeownership. So we estimate this model uh, where the dependent variable is the percentage of homosexuals moving between states defined as the number of homosexuals who move to a state C in GRT over the total number of homosexuals at risk of migrating. That is those living in other states in GRT, so they are capable to move to a state C in GRT. But I'd like to know that our results are robust to the redefinition of this uh, dependent variable. Our main explanatory variable is legalization. Um, this is a dummy variable taking value one when Stacy has legal same-sex marriage in year T for his periods and zero otherwise. So in this way, we include in our estimations dummies uh, capturing whether uh, same-sex marriage has a, an effect for one to two years, for three to four years, and so on. Um, we also control for year and state fixed effects, and we run our estimations separately for gays and lesbians. So here we have our main results, and as can be seen in the first column, uh, we find that uh, same-sex marriage legalization um, increases the percentage of gays who move to a state allowing same-sex marriage, but no effect is found among lesbians in, in the third column. In the case of gays, I like to know that the effect is sizable since it represents almost half of the mean of the percentage of gays moving between states. And the effect is uh, almost um, doubling seven years after the introduction of the law. 
In this other table, as I mentioned before, we control for other legal changes affecting homosexuals that also took place during our period of the study. So here we control for the year of the legalization of homoparental adoption, the prohibition of discrimination based on gender identity in employment, in housing, and in public accommodation, the approval of gender change in birth certificates, and the introduction of the repeal of sodomy laws. And almost in almost all periods, we still detect the positive and significant effect. Now we control for distant related costs. Uh, this is something very important, important in migration decisions. So we control for this by including the um, number of air passengers arriving to each uh, state by year. Uh, those states with a high fly availability, maybe also those receiving a high number of passengers and therefore those with a lower distant related cost of migrating. And as can be seen, again, our results are maintained. Now to, to check whether this effect wasn't transitory, we analyze the effect of same-sex marriage legalization on the stock of homosexuals. So now we redefine our dependent variable as the number of homosexuals living in state C in year T per 100 habitants. And here we find a significant effect, but only one to four years after the introduction of the law. Uh, so this means that the effect uh, seems to be in the short time. And um, finally, in this table, um, as uh, same-sex marriage uh, legalization can attract homosexuals to those states allowing same-sex marriage, it, it is possible also that um, uh, push some individuals to leave a state allowing same-sex marriage, and in particular those individuals uh, less tolerant or whose culture is less tolerant uh, in terms of uh, sexual uh, orientation. Uh, so now we study the effect on the law on the percentage of immigrants who were born in intolerant countries moving between states. And we define intolerant countries as those in which homosexuality is, is still uh, criminalized uh, according to the International Lesbian and Gay Association. And here we find a negative and significant effect one to four years after the introduction of the law. So as expected, this is um, the legalization of same-sex marriage is uh, pushing these intolerant individuals to leave a state allowing same-sex marriage. So finally, to conclude, um, we find that same-sex marriage legalization appears to matter in migration behavior, but only for gays and not for lesbians. Uh, our results are robust to different uh, robustness checks, and I didn't show you, but we only include some lags in our estimations to be sure that there is not a pre-trend in our coefficients and we don't find a significant effect. Um, we also find an effect in the short term on the stock of migrants, and finally, cultural differences regarding homosexuality uh, seems to be important in migration decisions of some individuals, intolerant individuals. And that is all. Thank you. Great, great, Marina. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you very much Thank for you. this uh, uh, great paper. Yes, please, Doris, uh, would you like to start with some uh, questions? Thank you. Uh, actually, I just wanted to, to applaud. I think that's a very nice piece of research. Uh, okay. And uh, I have written one of the um, surveys, uh, but I haven't come across uh, this literature under migration yet. Uh, so many thanks for this, this contribution. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, do we have questions from uh, our Attendance. Uh, Marina, can I ask? Um, yes. Uh, great research. Um, um, regarding the dependent variable, do you have information that is, did you utilize information for individuals or also for couples? That is no, the, the, only, only individuals. 
Um, and yeah, just one individual in the household, not the partner. Okay. We, we, we know um, we know some characteristics of the of the partner, like the, the gender, and this is why we can identify uh, uh, those individuals living with a same sex partner. But nice. And perhaps, okay, however, this will be a new research. Uh, did you try to interact uh, to, to practice with the interaction effects in order to examine the employment status? That is, once they are in the new state, what about their employment status? That is, it is easier to find a job. Do they have a job? Uh, that is, however, I believe that this is a different reason. However, in case you have uh, tried to examine what is going on in terms of employment status once in the new state yes yes i think we can do it yes because we have information on the employment status of the of the partner i think yes this yeah, is but, but, but perhaps this will be interesting in order to observe their employment status before in their host uh, let, let's say country or in the host state and in the new before state. migrating yes 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 uh, mm, this is i'm not sure if, no i i don't think that that we have this information. I think we have the the employment status uh, now in the in the, in the, in the, the host country. Yes. Nice. And uh, uh, can we offer any policy implication that is for uh, states or for countries who are working to consider relevant policies? That is, in terms of policy implications, uh, in your work, did you offer any policy implication? Yes, well, we can say that um, differences in the timing of introduction of laws in general uh, within a country um, may push people to move between within the country, between states. Nice. Um... The very interesting work, and I have you know one question after the other. Uh, so, did you have information for both natives and that is Americans and? Um, let's say non-Americans, have you calculated the percentage, that is how many, uh, let's say, Americans moves in compares to how many immigrants they move? Immigrants, we can do it. Okay. Yes, because, we can do it. Because you have an excellent data set, you know, you, you, you can offer too many um, specifications. Great, great, great. Thank you, thank you again. Thank you. Do we have additional questions? Uh, in case you have a question, definitely we can use the, uh, you can write okay. your, yeah, yes, the, the chat. So if we don't have a further question, uh, we can continue with uh, Doris. And as we said, in case we have further questions, please use the chat in order to inform the discussion. Thank you again, Marina. And many, uh, and let's welcome Doris. Doris, the floor is yours. So you see my slides? Everything's yes, working? Please. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Great. Uh, so many thanks for having me here today. Um, I will present a brief overview of my chapter on discrimination due to sexual orientation that came out in the Handbook of Labor, uh, Human Resources and Population Economics uh, this year. Many thanks uh, to Klaus for putting together uh, this handbook. Many thanks uh, for putting together this whole conference. Um, in this chapter that I will uh, talk about here, um, I focus on labor market discrimination on uh, against gays, lesbians, and bisexuals. And I focus in particular on earning studies, um, as well as experiments uh, in hiring in particular. Uh, the chapter does not cover issues of uh, uh, transgender identity or gender identity more generally. Um, these are actually covered in separate chapters. And I'm very happy that actually we have uh, one of those chapters uh, as uh, the next presentation. Um, we now have economic uh, studies on LGBTQ issues for more than 25 years. Uh, so Lee Badgett uh, started this whole economic debate with her public, uh, with her seminal publication uh, that came out in 1995. So this may seem like a long time, uh, but actually um, research on gay and lesbian issues started comparatively late uh, compared to other um, discrimination research uh, that focused on other groups. Uh, however, despite this maybe slow or late uh, start, 
uh, the literature is really flourishing today, as also David Card has uh, mentioned yesterday in his uh, talk. So I think uh, there's really a lot of very interesting uh, stuff going on here. During these last 25 years, of course, a lot has changed also. Um, we have found that in many countries, uh, attitudes towards uh, gays and lesbians have become somewhat more tolerant. Um, many countries have also introduced anti-discrimination laws. We have just heard about the introduction of uh, uh, same-sex marriage laws. So there has been uh, a lot of changes, at least uh, in some countries. Um, however, of course, um, prejudice is still lingering. And uh, so in that way, uh, the presumption probably is uh, uh, that we have to deal with uh, discrimination for still some, some time, uh, although evidence goes in the direction that it might be decreasing. There are quite some studies uh, that look at earnings differentials um, based on sexual orientation. Uh, so researchers compare wages of gays and lesbians and heterosexuals holding human capital um, variables constant. And uh, most of the researchers use either of uh, the following um, indicators for sexual orientation. So uh, they typically use either uh, sexual behavior measures. Uh, so some surveys uh, include questions on the sex of past uh, sex partners. Some research use uh, household data that has information on couple status, so how people within the household relate to each other and what sex there are. So this allows us to identify at least coupled um, gays and lesbians. And uh, recently, services have also introduced questions on sexual identity, where people are asked about their self-identification, whether they identify as heterosexual, bisexual, gay, or lesbian. And uh, this sexual uh, identity measure is typically regarded as the best indicator to measure discrimination, because uh, it is most likely to be the best a proxy for being out at the workplace. And this is uh, unfortunate. Uh, data usually doesn't provide information on people being out in the workplace. Uh, this is, of course, unfortunate because uh, being out in the workplace is a precondition for uh, being discriminated. Uh, but this is the situation, and therefore, sexual identity uh, is considered to be a good measure because it will most likely proxy this uh, the best, this being out on the job. On this slide, uh, I show you a list of some of the studies that have been conducted on uh, discrimination against, or earnings differentials, I should say, uh, against uh, gays and lesbians in the US. And uh, you see here, that uh, most of these studies have found that um, gay men earn less than equally qualified heterosexual men. And this, of course, um, goes along with the hypothesis that they're discriminated in the labor market. However, um, it was quite surprising uh, when the first studies showed uh, that lesbians actually earn more than equally qualified heterosexual women. And Nick will uh, show his uh, recent meta-analysis uh, a bit later in detail, uh, but uh, just uh, some one piece of uh, first information on this, uh, he found that uh, overall studies show that uh, in recent studies, gay men have a 7% penalty with regard to earnings, while lesbian women actually has have a premium of 7% on average. And this, of course, um, is not so easily to reconcile with discrimination, which nevertheless may occur if we uh, are aware about the potentially unobserved heterogeneity uh, issues that we have there. So um, we know that in heterosexual household, we have a very strong specialization in uh, labor. So uh, men tend to focus on uh, labor market work, uh, women on domestic chores. In gay and lesbian households, 
uh, this appears to be less so. There's at least very strong evidence for lesbian households that there is much less uh, segre segregation or specialization, I should say. Um, and because lesbians are less bound to the role of the homemaker, um, they may have more time, they may have more energy, and they may also may do more investments into labor market uh, activities. So this may one um, uh, explanation for why they earn more in uh, the labor market than heterosexual women. There's also uh, evidence that lesbians are more often in male dominated occupations than um, uh, heterosexual women. The reverse actually is true for uh, gay men who are more often in female dominated occupations. And uh, not all studies can fully control for all occupational features and uh, for very specific occupational types. So also there might be some unobserved heterogeneity going on. Some have also argued uh, that there may be differences in personality that might matter, uh, that may be responsible for their earnings gap. Uh, but those studies that are able to look at uh, effects of personality and um, of mental health, they actually do not find that they contribute anything to the earnings gap. Um, there are a few studies that uh, look at bisexuals, uh, possibly also because there's less data that allows to examine them. As Nick has also shown in his meta-analysis, uh, bisexuals actually fare the worst. So they have the largest penalties, and uh, particularly for women, actually, while lesbian women have a premium, uh, we find that bisexual women actually have also an earnings penalty. Um, so this has led some authors to argue that bisexuals might be the most discriminated. And they argue that this is also likely because they're affected by the most negative stereotypes. And indeed, psychologists have shown um, that attitudes that uh, bisexuals are particularly negative. Um, this may be related to the belief uh, that they would be promiscuous, or uh, some people also argue that um, bisexuals would have a choice uh, in contrast to um, gays and lesbians with respect to the sex of their partner. Whatever the reason, uh, attitudes are indeed quite uh, severely negative to towards bisexuals. However, also there might be uh, an issue of unobserved heterogeneity. At least a very interesting uh, study by Sabia points in this uh, direction. Uh, this study makes use of very, very rich uh, data that includes information on personality, appearance, uh, psychological well-being, etc. And this study actually can explain quite a bit of this earnings penalty for bisexual uh, individuals. So I think there's just uh, very much under-researched uh, at this point, and we cannot fully explain yet uh, what is going on here with respect to bisexuals. Recently, a few studies uh, have not um, compared the effect of sexual orientation within sex, uh, but they have shown uh, a wage hierarchy. And this I found uh, quite illustrative. Um, so these studies show that still heterosexual males are the highest earning income group. And for example, Wade and co-authors have shown for Canada um, that heterosexual males are followed uh, by gay men, lesbians, bisexual men, heterosexual women, and bisexual women at the bottom of uh, the income uh, hierarchy. A similar study by Humpert for Germany has looked at more uh, detailed categories even, and uh, Humpert has confirmed that heterosexual married men still earn the most, and he showed that actually all female types are at the bottom of the hierarchy, of the wage hierarchy. So I think this is quite illustrative uh, because it makes this huge effect of sex uh, that we still have uh, really visible. 
So very often we talk about uh, this lesbian wage premium, uh, but if we look at uh, the wage hierarchy, we really can put this under perspective and we see uh, that yeah, still uh, lesbians earn much less than heterosexual men. Um, and uh, this we also find when we look at household incomes, uh, we typically find that lesbians, although they earn more uh, than sexual women on average, uh, lesbians as a couple have the lowest household income, uh, which of course then also is a poverty issue. Now, I have indicated uh, that uh, studies looking at earnings, um, they have issues with unobserved heterogeneity and therefore they may not be ultimately able to prove discrimination. For this reason, uh, people have increasingly uh, used experiments. Um, experiments allow uh, to really control for all individual characteristics uh, of employees, of productive characteristics. We control for whether we out uh, people to the employer in an experiment. The most um, established method uh, is the so-called correspondence uh, studies uh, method where standardized applications that are identical in all productive characteristics, uh, but differ, um, for example, with respect to sexual orientation, are sent to firms. And then the researcher measures who gets how many positive callbacks. And if one person gets less callbacks than the other, then this is uh, typically considered to be discrimination. How can we signal uh, sexual orientation? Well, for example, by indicating a voluntary activity in a gay and lesbian organization or indicating uh, the sex of a partner. Now, uh, some 20 years ago, I did the first uh, large scale study, study on uh, this uh, of this type. And I was particularly interested in whether I would find discrimination against lesbians because at that point we only had these uh, results from earnings uh, differentials uh, that lesbians would be earning more uh, than heterosexual women. And indeed, uh, what I found in this study was that lesbians received dramatically fewer callbacks than heterosexual women. In the meantime, uh, there's a, la a large amount of research that has been done for different OECD countries. Most of these studies do show uh, significant uh, penalties for gays and lesbians, although the specific results very much change between countries and studies. So for example, Nick has uh, found the highest levels of discrimination in Cyprus and Greece. Uh, we have uh, two insignificant uh, results for the US, um, one insignificant result uh, for lesbians in Italy, and actually for Belgium, uh, one study has found some uh, preferential treatment for young lesbians, at least on a marginally significant level. But overall, um, as a meta-analysis also shows, uh, we do find very severe and significant discrimination against gays and lesbians. Nick, how am I doing uh, with time? I could come to the end immediately or I could have one more slide. Um, we have two additional minutes. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, so some of these experiments also try to investigate uh, whether stereotypes about gays and lesbians are responsible for their different uh, treatment. In particular, um, gays and lesbians are often believed to be less gender conformant uh, than heterosexuals, and this may lead to different uh, labor market outcomes. Indeed, in my first uh, study, I also varied uh, whether uh, the applicant presented themselves as more masculine or more feminine in their applications. Uh, in Austria, we also use uh, photographs uh, in applications, so this helped in, in that regard. However, I did not find any differences in discrimination uh, based on sexual orientation with regard to signaling masculinity or femininity. Other studies have indicated uh, something different. Um, for example, some studies have looked at uh, to what degree uh, gays and lesbians are discriminated if 
advertisements ask for feminine or masculine characteristics in the worker. And they have found that gays, uh, gays would be more discriminated if ads ask for masculine characteristics and lesbians were more discriminated uh, if ads asked for feminine characteristics. So this points at a belief that uh, they may be less gender conformant. And also uh, studies have found uh, that discrimination against gay men is high in male dominated uh, jobs and lesbians are more discriminated in female dominated jobs. So this may also be because of uh, these beliefs uh, that uh, gays and lesbians are more uh, less uh, gender conformant. Uh, of course, it could also be that employers fear problems if they mix people of the same sex, uh, but different sexual orientation. One study, the last one that I want to mention, uh, actually also investigates whether there might be positive statistical discrimination vis-a-vis -vis lesbians, um, as they're less likely to become pregnant and uh, take a, a career interruption. And for Belgium, indeed, uh, this is uh, what Bert uh, finds. Um, for young women, actually, uh, it seems to be a benefit to indicate to be a lesbian. Um, Belgium, of course, as Bert argues, is a very liberal country with uh, very friendly attitudes towards gays and lesbian. So in this particular case, it might be that uh, actually positive statistical discrimination even outweighs uh, prejudice uh, that exists. So let me sum up. Uh, what we find uh, in those earning studies is typically uh, penalties for gay men, um, uh, premiums for lesbian women, even though these effects narrow over time, and I think Nick is probably going to say more about this. Um, of course, earnings studies are not able to really prove discrimination. Um, experiments are much more um, applicable for, for that uh, purpose. Um, experiments have been considered to provide clear uh, and uh, ultimate truths uh, for the existence of uh, discrimination. Um, and actually, those correspondence uh, tests, uh, apart from a very few exceptions, very clearly show large levels of discrimination against gay men and lesbian women. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doris. This was amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Do we have questions from the participants? Do we have? Nice. Um, may I ask a question? Um, because this is a constant, let's say, question I have, and mainly regarding lesbian women. That is, on the one hand, they experience higher salaries, all in all. However, if we consider statistics, mainly in the US, as well as in the UK, they experience higher poverty rates. That is, is this quite puzzling? That is, on the one hand, they experience higher uh, salaries or wages or income. However, in the same time, based on national representative uh, statistics, they experience higher poverty rates. Th that, that is, do you have any reflection on this? Is this a puzzling, let's say, issue in the literature regarding lesbian women? And also, if we consider each and every qualitative study, lesbian women experience lower job satisfaction, a higher level of harassment, bullying. However, in the same time, higher wages. Is this uh, quite puzzling? So I think this is a very good comment. Um, and I'm not sure whether the, the literature really has fully accounted for this, um, because you're absolutely right uh, that with respect to poverty right, uh, rates, we, we see this phenomenon. Um, so what would be maybe of interest uh, would be uh, to look at earnings on different percentiles. Um, so I do not think, um, at least I can't uh, recall from, from the top of my head, uh, that studies really do quantile regressions. Uh, so it might be of interest to really look at um, whether these results are driven by 
some particularly well-earning uh, women, while there might be some on the uh, lower uh, income uh, sphere that actually are very close to poverty. It may also have something to do, of course, uh, with participation rates. Um, I have to admit, I'm not so much an expert on, on the poverty debate, uh, and I'm not sure to what degree unemployment uh, is a, a reason in that regard. Um, so yes, you're, you're pointing to very important issues that are still uh, under uh, researched, I, I would think. Thank you, thank you for your insight. And the other, let's say, question I have, uh, whenever we try to approach lesbian women's uh, premiums, the literature indicates this might be because they experience higher human capital. However, since in their regressions, in each and every regression, we control for education, we control for, yes, we control for human capital skills. So this might not be a reason that is since in the regression we consider human capital. So we have tried to reduce heterogeneity. So is this, let's say, a valid argument that perhaps women experience, lesbian women experience higher wages due to higher human capital? Because already we have controlled for this. That is, do you have any reflection on this? And the mm -hmm. same holds also. The same holds also with uh, uh, the number of uh, persons in the household rega regarding whether they have children or not. In most regressions, we are able to control for uh, household arrangements and for children. So, is it valid to indicate that uh, per perhaps lesbians experience higher wages due to higher human capital and due to lower, let's say, number of uh, children? So um, you're right, we can usually control for the most important human capital characteristics. It's by the way, I think always quite interesting also to point out uh, that on average, gays and lesbians tend to have higher human capital on average uh, than heterosexuals. Um, however, um, of course, there are some human capital elements that may be less easy to grasp, right? So if you think about some training that you can get uh, at your workplace, et cetera, um, this kind of human capital probably you will not have um, in, in your typical set of data. And I think still what is important is really this specialization issue. And I think also there's, a lot of interest in the literature on this topic um, because as uh, we know of course we have this heterosexual division of labor as I said before in heterosexual households with a very clear distinction about who is the main responsible for which sphere uh, and in uh, lesbian households even if there is a child uh, the distribution of work is going to work differently. So there's a lot of research pointing to uh, that there's less spe specialization going on there. Um, and um, also uh, just uh, in pure numbers, um, it is less likely that uh, as an employer, if you have a, a lesbian, um, even if there is a, a specialization in the household, uh, you're not sure who the one uh, you would have uh, hired. Um, so it is much less clear, um, even if there would be specialization, who would be doing uh, what. Uh, there's no signal to an employer who that person would be. Uh, and on average, um, I think uh, it, there's quite clear evidence uh, that uh, women are less consumed, uh, lesbian women are less consumed by domestic chores uh, than heterosexual women. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. In the final and final question, uh, in your in your country, in Austria, because the last twenty years you, you have uh, produced amazing experimental studies. In your country, uh, can you observe an improvement uh, in terms of uh, bias treatments based on your experimental technique? Can you observe an improvement? The last so, twenty years. So actually. I think Austria is one of the countries that does not have any uh, earning studies, but actually you referred to the experimental studies. Uh, and I have not redone uh, an experiment on sexual orientation in Austria. Uh, and 
this is maybe also a worthwhile debate that we might have about research uh, because it is quite difficult to actually publish a replication of a piece uh, in a later uh, point in time. Um, yeah, because uh, uh, it's considered a replication that does not create so much interest uh, in journals. So I'm not sure what Klaus uh, thinks in that regard, uh, whether the Journal of Population Economics is interested in, in replications. Uh, but I, I always shied away <laughs> from such studies uh, because I, I feared uh, publication problems in that regard. So unfortunately for Austria, I cannot say anything. I haven't uh, repeated such a study. So all in all, all, in all and based on your uh, chapter at the end, what is your conclusion? Is there a progress all in all? Or is it so, difficult due to lack of data? It is difficult to provide a robust, let's say, um, evaluation argument. So I do think that we see that uh, sexual orientation gaps decrease, uh, at least with respect to earnings, uh, where we might be able to make the easiest comparisons. Um, of course, we don't quite know. This may also come from the fact that men and women become more equal uh, with respect to their labor market behavior. Um, so this may be also a driver uh, in this regard. Um, but I think we do see a clear tendency. So actually we found the first studies that uh, have zero effects also for gay men. Um, so it's not so robust. Also your meta-analysis I think uh, is able to show quite nicely uh, that there seems to be a time trend there. Um, so I think there is something going on and uh, let's hope that this continues. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your uh, presentation. Thank you so much for your amazing studies. I remember when I was a master's student, the first experimental study I read was your study and I was so much impressed. And this was the reason why I started to follow. So you have been such an <laughs> inspiration. <laughs> Great, great. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Doris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we are um, able to continue with uh, Katerina. Katerina from Anglia Raskin University from the UK will present her work on uh, uh, legislation and uh, uh, trans people's human rights. Katerina, are you ready to share your screen? Perfect. Nice. We can uh, see your screen. Great. Just a minute. I believe you are able to see me now, right? Yes, 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 thank you. Uh, good afternoon uh, from me as well. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for organizing such a great event today and uh, giving us this fantastic opportunity to share our work. Uh, my name is Katerina Sidiropoulou and I'm a senior lecturer in the National Business and Commercial Law uh, with great interest uh, in uh, researching around the various employment law matters, uh, including workplace uh, discrimination, uh, equality and well-being. So today I'm going to share uh, the work that was published in uh, the Handbook of uh, Labor and Human Resources and Population Economics with the title Gender identity minority and workplace legislation in uh, Europe. So the main aim of this study was to uh, provide an overview of uh, the present legal and policy situation of trans employees in uh, Europe, as well as to strengthen the existing knowledge by confirming what the legal practice and previous uh, reliable, credible and relevant uh, scholarly works have shown so far. Before that, it is really important uh, to clarify here that my main focus was on uh, trans employees, as I said earlier. So we refer to this, uh, uh, to those individuals uh, whose personal identity, expression and gender uh, it doesn't correspond uh, with the sex uh, sign at birth. Uh, for example, we might be dealing with uh, a person uh, who is biologically female and is feeling that a male uh, identity is a better fit. So uh, he's dressed as a man and is using uh, male uh, names and pronouns. 
or we can also refer to those uh, that they physically transition from male to female and vice versa uh, by undergoing a sex reassignment uh, surgeries or uh, hormone therapies. So let's see first when uh, workplace discrimination takes place at which stages based on previous studies um, we, we have seen that uh, trans uh, people are discriminated almost at all stages. So from the moment that they are looking uh, for a job, during their interview stage, when they uh, actually access the labor market, when they're doing some voluntary work, and of course towards the end, when they are actually forced to leave the job after transition due to the gender identity, their expression and appearance. Um, I need to state at this point how difficult it is um, to get information and credible data uh, for trans uh, people's experiences. Um, there is a lack of uh, uh, consistent reporting, let's say, exactly because uh, trans uh, uh, employees hesitate to share their experiences, what they experience at work. Um, there are a range of claims that they are brought in court, and we have seen that uh, a good chance uh, um, have better those that they have completed already uh, the gender confirmation surgery. So what do they really experience? Um, they have to confront various transphobic attitudes from the colleagues, from the employers, from whoever is in the workplace. Uh, we talk about an unpleasant situation that actually caused them distress. Um, and they are manifested in various ways in the workplace. For example, uh, they see that there is uh, an inappropriate uh, use of language that is made in the policies or in various other documents. Uh, they also have this sense of fear of being uh, suspected of using fraudulent uh, documents by the employers. They also feel sometimes exposed to the ignorance of the colleagues and employers for not knowing how to treat them while in transitioning. Uh, many difficulties with conforming with uh, gender specific dress codes or with the use of various uh, facilities in a workplace. And of course, we've seen a number of uh, breaches of the privacy of personal sensitive data. And uh, most importantly, uh, they are uh, constantly, we, we've seen that they have refused of medical services and any other treatment or access to social security schemes or even access to higher positions. So in brief, uh, they all feel uh, marginalized and stigmatized uh, in the workplace uh, settings. What about the legal protection here? Do they actually offer any protection? Um, what is available to us so far based on this study? So what we see is that in general, uh, if we, for example, look at the Treaty of uh, Lisbon or the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, um, it reminds to all EU member states that the, it is really uh, important to respect uh, human dignity, freedom, uh, equality and all rights. Um, the European Convention on Human Rights also states that all rights and all freedoms uh, must be secured without discrimination on any ground. Of course, for us, for all legal professionals, um, the leading case here, because we don't have many cases, we don't see many cases, uh, is that of uh, P versus S, that we're talking about the case of a trans woman uh, that she was dismissed uh, when uh, she actually revealed to her employer that uh, she was undergoing the gender reassignment. Uh, of course, the European Court of Justice um, decided in favor of uh, Mrs. P and she was entitled to compensation. By that time, because it's a very old case, but it's a landmark case until today, uh, we had the, uh, Europe, the Equal Treatment Directive that was in place. Um, and actually the position of the court was that uh, this provides sufficient uh, protection to all trans people. I'd like to make a note here that this was covered in the preamble of the particular directive that was actually later amended by gender recast directives. 
And all these directives, we see that they highlight the importance again of gender equality, but they mention between a man and a woman. Um, so I would like here to say that what we note is that we refer to very general legislative protective uh, pieces of legislation. They are not very labor focused, as we can understand, uh, based on uh, reviewing on relevant studies and uh, reports. Uh, we find that uh, very few EU countries have banned, for example, gender identity discrimination, or very few countries have explicit equality or non-discrimination laws. The most important of all is that we see that in this non-exhaustive list of protective characteristics, uh, there is always reference to any other uh, protective characteristics such as that of race, of uh, age, social origins, uh, ethnic origins, but this list never includes uh, that uh, characteristic of gender identity, expression, uh, identification, or even uh, sex uh, characteristics. And overall, all this protection for direct and indirect discrimination, they are very inconsistent. So we understand that a lot of work needs to be done. Though, because I'm a positive person and um, we really have to improve things uh, for trans uh, uh, people rights uh, in the workplace, uh, our, uh, from this study, I have revealed some uh, uh, really good examples um, because I argue here that there is some progress um, in improving things in Europe, whereas uh, some other claim that there is stagnation at the moment. I understand their arguments, but if you can see here, for example, I say that Denmark became the first leading uh, EU country to adopt a self-determination model uh, in its legislation, because so far we have various uh, procedures for sex uh, reassignment quite complicated, and this has to be uh, reviewed, decided by judges or other medical experts. But now there is a greater push to have a, um, another uh, procedure that is uh, easily accessible, uh, that is very quick, based on uh, self-determination. Uh, Norway, then, is uh, one of these examples that have introduced anti-discrimination arts with actually accessible to young people. Uh, Finland is one of these countries, again, uh, whose legislation was tailored and was amended in order to be uh, applicable in the workplace uh, context. In Sweden, it was the first country, again, in the world to decide that uh, trans employees and uh, trans people are entitled to compensation uh, for these cases that were forcibly sterilized between the dates of 1972 and to 2013. In Ireland, again, they introduced a gender recognition act. Mm, for me, it's a good starting point for this European effort because uh, um, enables uh, trans uh, people to achieve full legal recognition of the preferred gender. Uh, Malta, which is an excellent example, together with Finland in whatever they do, um, passed one of the most radical pieces of legislation quite recently, that of the Gender Identity, Gender Expression and Sex Characteristics Act. In Germany, Germany was uh, the first EU country to offer a third gender option, what we are talking about, on official documents, to this gender non-conforming uh, in their six uh, people. Belgium uh, uh, continues to be since uh, 1795, one of these good examples because of the passing of numerous uh, equality laws. Luxembourg, um, for me, it's a very good example again because it's uh, managed to introduce one of the simplest and self-determined non-judicial gender recognition procedures. If you compare this, uh, initiatives so far, uh, together by looking at this map, we see uh, with the red uh, color, the pink, uh, the, the yellow one, 
the violations here of human rights, whereas those in green, these are the EU countries that actually respect uh, human rights and they put uh, a significant effort to improve things. Um, we have other examples uh, where they actually uh, show slower progress in trans rights protection. For example, uh, we, we can see, and to be honest, not to refer just to a couple of uh, cases here, a couple of countries, it's mm, the actual picture that we get regarding trans rights protection in whole Europe. Um, so, for example, we don't see any specific provisions on gender identity, on any specific rules on formal procedures, or the minimum requirements, at, at least that they are expected for gender recognition. Or there is a chaos around the use of these legal terms. Various terms are used, but few people can understand the main differences. Or the number of laws that we have to advise in order to understand what is the situation. Um, and so on. Or other examples are the several incidents of hate speech that we see in a, uh, some countries. There is a slight proof as to this. Um, so if I want to sum up, and based on what I've studied here is that um, there is still this need for policymakers to synthesize all this plethora, the several documents, legal or not, uh, that they are available, that is very difficult uh, to be um, collected, retrieved, not in relation to the acts that are already in place, but all other documents, reports that provide all this uh, fantastic information. So uh, in order to be in a position as a legal professional to improve things. So we understand that we have to consider all this, uh, all, uh, all of us together, not only the legal professionals, but also the medical experts, academics, the media that help a lot in order to form or improve or to form uh, workplace policies that will actually, will always aim for more improved uh, and uh, inclusive workplace environments, and we'll always aim at uh, promoting the well-being of uh, trans employees. So a lot of things needs to be done. We understand that, and not only at the organizational level, at the societal, at the European, at the national. I have also included the various uh, works, an indicative list of works that I have uh, consulted here, and I have learned a lot. And thank you. I'm here at your disposal to ask me any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. This was great. And it was extremely important to have a lawyer with us, uh, a most uh, interesting study. And definitely your chapter is very popular in the hard book uh, in terms of uh, download. So thank you so much for your uh, contribution. Um, do we have any question from uh, um, our participants? Uh, hi, Adriana. Uh, educational qualifications and younger people. So still a lot of things needs to be done. It's a collective work and all these uh, stakeholders need to sit down together and uh, agree uh, what is needed and what is not needed because it's far too confusing at the moment. Uh, thank you, Katerina. I remember in the office we had this discussion uh, regarding the current prime minister in the UK because the current prime minister in the UK announced his plans to remove trans people's rights from the Equality Act. Do you have any reflection? That is why the current prime minister in the UK, why the current government to remove uh, uh, people from uh, uh, the Equality Act? Do you have any reflection? You never know why, what is the reason behind all these decisions. Uh, yes, we had this uh, discussion there. And especially at the moment, it's something that I didn't mention here, but it was covered as part of this study. Uh, a greatest example, in fact, at this moment, is the example of the UK, because they have already designed the, the government equalities office in the past, they have designed this guidance for employers that actually provide all these recommendations, the, the guidelines that need to be followed in the workplace settings. Um, you can, I want to justify or wonder why 
uh, he has acted in this way while he has this, but as a lawyer, I would take him that he will be in breach because already is part of the Equality Act and it's very difficult to remove because he will need to provide also a reasonable justification for whatever he does. Uh, we don't talk about, okay, we don't have actual uh, information as to the actual number of uh, trans employees, but uh, there is a rough estimation that we um, talk about 1.5 million in euro. So it's not a small number. I, try, I tried I tried to follow the Prime Minister rhetoric and mainly uh, he has indicated for me, he has said for me there are only two genders, male, female. So this is the reason why. So That's perhaps it. perhaps it's not very valid. I want, I, will, I want to be polite because I oh. know what, which is the reason. And oh, um, yeah. this is the reason why most of the uh, EU countries hesitate to uh, go ahead because there is uh, this feeling of hate, this feeling of uh, disgust about okay. trans employees. And mm. this is unacceptable. I mean, at yeah. our years, there is no reason of uh, reacting in this way. Nice. And I have a final question. You have presented several good case studies from several countries which proactively work in order to support trans people's rights. Uh, did you try or do you know whether these people in these countries experience better labor market outcomes, they experience uh, better income? That is because you have presented a list of several countries with more with, with, with better coverage in terms of trans people's rights. Uh, did you try to investigate whether in those countries, trans people experience higher level of employment or uh, lower poverty, or is this something that you have an interest to work in the future, to consider in the future? Definitely, yeah, because I'm uh, examining things from a legal perspective, I was uh, focusing primarily on the reviewing of all these legal documents, and it was very difficult to retract because some are amended, some are repealed, uh, some are too generic, and then people were saying why these are applicable in our case they are very very broad but you are right I really like this it's something that again we need to consider because it will prove a lot more apart from examining all, only their well-being um, it would be worthy to examine their income yes to combine also, it with other factors, of course. And, and also it might be interesting also to consider some intersectionality issues around gender identity, sexual orientation in terms of legislation and what kind of acts we have, because it can become extremely complicated if we try to simultaneously examine uh, sexual orientation rights with uh, gender identity rights. So this perhaps might be an interesting uh, study to consider. Nice, nice. Thank you very much for your presentation, uh, uh, Katerina. Thank you. Really, thank you. Now we will uh, continue with our fourth presenter, Evangelos. Evangelos from the University of Oulu in Finland. Evangelos will present a study on sexual identity and gender gap in leadership. Whenever, Evangelos, you are uh, ready, uh, please uh, share your screen. Okay, yes, we can see now your screen. The floor. You, can, you can see my screen, right? Yes, 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 please. Thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Zimmerman for the invitation to be part of this very interesting session. Um, <clears throat> moreover, uh, Nick and uh, Doris, you are uh, two big inspirations for me. I'm a junior researcher and uh, I'm trying with my research to give uh, small stones on equality. And uh, my paper, working paper today, it's entitled Sexual Identity and Gender Gap in Leadership. Uh, it is a an field experiment joined with uh, George Kribas and Konstantinos Yotopoulos. So, the basic research questions, do women and men make different choices about becoming candidates when they face the same decision problem? How does being a woman or homosexual affect perceptions of being fit for gender and sexual stereotype positions? And who wants to lead and why? Um, we established that uh, there are fundamental sexual and gender behavioral differences stemming from differences in underlying psychological mechanisms and abilities due to the nature of electoral competition. We find that priming individuals to consider 
the competitive nature of politics has a big negative effect on women's and homosexuals' interest to engage, to run for a political office, and not for men's and heterosexual ones. Um, hence, this, of course, increased the sexual and gender uh, gap in leadership ambition. While on uh, the uh, online experiment uh, that we conduct as a robustness, the, the gender gap holds. Surprisingly, we found that homosexuals' intention to participate in politics uh, follows in the opposite way. So some very general uh, introduction notes, sexual orientation and gender discrimination have been constantly under investigation by the research body. And we have many attempts that try to understand these determinants of leadership. Although attitudes towards females and homosexual individuals are changing year to year, most politicians are still white straight men. For example, in the USA, Congress remains 83% white and uh, male, while the EU parliament nowadays consists of 60% of males and 88% of whites. Although women make up the majority of the US, US population, again, they hold only about 20% of elected uh, offices and 24% of state legislative seats and 10% of governorships. The share of women in, uh, respectively in the EU population, again, is approximately 51%, but again, only six EU countries has reached a minimum threshold of 40% of women's participation in the parliaments. Concerning homosexuals, there is an estimation of 5% of the US, US population that identifies as being part of this LGBT community, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer, and uh, just 0.2% of them, they are elected in officially across all levels of American government, uh, and they are homosexuals. Uh, in Europe, the average percent of homosexuality by a country, in, although increases year by year, nonetheless, the political representation with homosexual leaders remains close to invisible and in public offices. Meanwhile, several surveys suggest the broad acceptance of homosexual individuals in politics in USA and uh, EU by citizens, which 64% saying that they would feel comfortable seeing a homosexual person in the highest elected position, while 54% would be comfortable with an interex person and 53% uh, with a transgender prime minister. Finally, uh, by fully integrating women and homosexuals into leadership positions, of course, is, uh, is, a, is, is a key, um, uh, plays a key role in a society to flourish. For that reason, we have to understand why this population, these minorities, these subgroups still encounter considerable barriers to reaching their full potential. And some of these barriers are at least in part self-imposed and have, of course, social relationship with uh, psychological determinants like personality traits. For example, we have the lean out phenomenon, especially for women that opting out slowly or stop their highly demanding ca careers, greatly thins the ranks of women who would be leaders. Brands and Fernandez in their paper in 2017 found that women's decision to lean out when they consider leadership role may very well be caused by psychological factors due to previous rejections or bias from gender-based stereotypes and discrimination. Overall, the literature suggests that perhaps women and homosexuals do at times hold themselves back. However, the reason for that is complex and of course needs further investigation. Salvati in 2016 and Pellegrini in 2020 revealed that several sexual mi minorities suffer of prejudices and negative attitudes when applying for leadership positions. As there is ample evidence that being openly gay or, or uh, lesbian still entails some concerns and may front the very issue of visibility may in itself affect the willingness of homosexuals to pursue for a leadership role. Unlike women and people of color whose identification usually is obvious, homosexual people often retain some decision about whether their sexual orientation identity must be part uh, and be known or not in their workplaces. 
thus a sense of aversion uh, in leadership positions may arise. Homosexuals often have to invest more and more in education uh, or have to constantly demonstrate their competence compared to the heterosexual ones in order to achieve the highest leadership positions. In the political world, this means that women and homosexual are less likely than men and heterosexuals to be recruited to run for elected office uh, and are more likely to be discouraged from running and are less likely to consider the themselves qualified to run and to participate to these procedures. Obviously, this decreases women's and homosexuals' leadership ambitions and leads to a form of discrimination. Several laboratory experiments have re revealed evidence that women are less likely than men to seek to be elected to political leadership uh, positions. While the uh, main finding here is based on various aspects uh, of the psychological uh, literature, the aforementioned uh, studies have mainly pointed out that women have lower motivation to lead and may be more concerned about whether they will be harm other individuals with the decisions that they will be need to make as leaders. So it, we, here we have an attempt to give a more comprehensive interpretation for the book. So we reveal that in the field experiment, priming participants to consider for competitive nature of politics has a significant negative effect on women's and homosexuals' interest. Surprisingly, we find that this effect on homosexuals' behavior towards leadership turns positive in the case of the online experiment. We also demonstrate that personality traits play an important role in the underlying decision regarding politics, especially for the homosexual participants. And we have also individual differences in honesty and trust that may explain differences in candidate entry decisions. So my main hypothesis here is that com competitiveness hypothesis, uh, which refers to the competit competitiveness treatment will depress women's leadership ambition relative to the control in both uh, samples. The competitiveness treatment will also depress homosexuals leadership ambition in the field experiment relative to the control. We have the competitiveness sexual and gender gap hypothesis which refers to the competitiveness treatment will depress all outcome variables for women more than men by increasing the gender gap in leadership relative to the control, following the same exactly direction for homosexuals in comparison with heterosexuals. Social preferences hypothesis, we expect, we expect that women and homosexuals with higher level of truth of, and uh, trust and honesty will behave with higher political aversion. And the personality trait hypothesis that we expect that consciousness uh, in general will have a negative impact on individual's engagement, while extraversion and openness will, have, will, will follow the opposite way. Really briefly, the experiment, we partnered with uh, the four biggest, largest parties in Greek politics. Our participants were party members registered in election lists and engaged in election procedures in national, regional, and municipal level as from 2014, we sent an email with a hyperlink to our experiment with a request to complete an important task containing personalized and innovative tips and tricks on how to exploit social media as a tool, as an effective tool for election campaigns. We wished to isolate the effect of the sexual orientation and gender of the candidate responding to our exogenous information while maintaining all the other factors, including the party, of course, the political party constant. By redirecting to an external link with our experiment, participants first had to answer a set of basic demographic questions and then to fill the big five personality test. After that, subjects were given a simplified version of the addition task in order to study their preferences from competition. This task involves uh, the computing of random two-digit numbers within a two-minute time framework. And of course, this was programmed with Z3. And at the end of the task, a message informed participants of their total correct answers and success rate. After that, our algorithm randomized the sample by gender and sexual orientation dynamically 
to receive one of two initial messages about running a political office. The control message used a neutral language in inviting participants to be a political candidate in the following elections and included a two paragraph description of the first steps in this direction, while the competitiveness treatment message asked participants whether they like arguing about political matters and thrive in competitive environments. It then included a generic discussion of the competitive nature of the politics uh, and before inviting subjects to consider running as a political candidate. Afterwards, subjects had the opportunity to require information about tips, tools, and strategies for an efficient campaign in a three-stage process. Each time they say yes, and they could proceed to the next step. This phase consisted of two texts about shaping the appearance by creating a political image and initial strategies for building up a social media presence. In the last phase, participants were asked if they would like to watch a three minute video containing real examples of an efficient use of social media tools in elections. During the experimental flow, the participants had the opportunity to respond no, and then they immediately go to the end of the experiment. In the ending part, in order to investigate whether participants' honesty and trust levels might explain differences in their uh, entry decisions and political engagement, we use the simplified version of CANTHAC lying a version task. So the subjects were given a scenario in which they were candidates and they had to choose a message for their campaign uh, based on the performance in the addition task that they had made in the beginning of the experiment. And they should um, inform their voters uh, about them. Participants have four possible messages that they could send to voters reflecting their line aversion. For example, a participant informed in the beginning by the system that he achieved X correct answers in the addition task. In the line aversion task was given to choose between messages, four messages. I solved many additions. I solved uh, the, the particular number of additions. I solved this number plus three and plus six. Afterwards, we cross-checked each numeric claim against the candidate's actual scores in the beginning of the experiment, and we and we build up the th the truthfulness uh, index about uh, each uh, participant in our experiment. The experiment was conducted in March 2022. The email uh, sent by the experimentalists was sent to over 2,000 political members, and this generated approximately 322 responses. We use these behavioral responses as proxies for political leadership ambition in our analysis. Of course, we know that uh, here that a big uh, limitation is the non-response bias, which is a very difficult uh, matter for uh, our field experiment. Uh, the only thing that we could do to address that is that we required for the political parties to provide us with the average demographic uh, values, and we uh, did not find any statistical significant differences for these variables between our participants and uh, average provided by these political parties. So, uh, to capture these effects, uh, we use a simple difference in difference econometric design. Uh, and the, our coefficient of interest, of course, is coefficient beta three, which will give us uh, this difference in leadership, uh, in leadership uh, ambition, intention, uh, due to sexual and gender gap. Our results really quick. We can see obvious uh, that we have big differences between males and females uh, in the in the first panel uh, up of the of the table. Uh, uh, the percentage who choose the, the three interests are each columns. Uh, and we have, uh, of course, the females choosing less and less of our um, interest uh, for running a political um, office. In the same, uh, similar way, we have the same, similar way differences between heterosexuals and homosexuals. Regarding the marginal effects of uh, the difference in difference approach, uh, we can see that uh, uh, the treatment regarding the treatment we have uh, regarding the, the, the gender, we find strong 
evidence uh, supporting H1 hypothesis of the competitiveness, while the table confirms that female participants uh, have significantly lower levels of uh, leadership and uh, intention, and the treatment coefficient is negatively and statistically significant across uh, more all the columns. Uh, concerning uh, the coefficient beta 3, which is the interaction between the treatment of the gender, the male in this, uh, in, in this table, of course, we see again that the, the uh, the coefficient is positive and statistically significant uh, in most of the columns. When we introduced the line categories and the personality traits, we, we again, uh, we see that several personality traits in relation to our hypothesis play a big role of whether a candidate wanted to entry a political, uh, for the political uh, office or not. And, uh, in relation to the sexual orientation, again, here we can see that, uh, sorry, yes, uh, we can see that uh, for the homosexuals, we have the interaction term being negatively and statistically significant to almost all our columns, which include the interests, uh, the text in interest one, the second test text in interest two, and the video, which is the interest number three, and again, we see that the same personality traits, but with even higher um, uh, effects, uh, are affecting uh, the decision of uh, the candidates to run for a political office. Now we turn uh, uh, in our online experiment, we conducted exactly the same experiment in Amazon Mechanical Turk, which our uh, pool there was from USA. Uh, I remind you here that our pool of, regarding the, the field experiment was from Greece. So in, uh, in the, regarding the gender gap, we see uh, approximately the same results uh, between the males and the females. Again, here the coefficient is positive and statistically significant for the males. While here we see a, the, a, an interesting part of this uh, experiment is that we see that now the coefficient of treatment and the homosexual candidates turns positive and statistically significant, uh, while I remind you here that it was negative in the field experiment. So we conducted our experiment within the context of politics because it is a field that is perceived with, of course, big levels of competitiveness and entails substantial gender and sexual imbalances. We followed the paper of Greece in 2015, and we also introduced competitiveness in uh, the same way in our experiment. And we follow CANFAC in 2015, and we highlighted the role of trust and honesty running for running an office. And we motivated by Heckman 2021, and we argue that personality traits also here play a role uh, for the decision of a candidate to run for an office or not. In both experiments, we reveal that female intentions marked a statistically significant decrease when they face the competitive nature of politics compared with males. And this finding is consistent with prior studies in the lab, which highlight that females in general, when, we, when they face a competitive environment, they shy away. Our findings also help in better understanding some of the sources and dynamics of gender difference suggesting that competitiveness together with other personality traits as extraversion, openness and consciousness and psychological factors as honesty and trust could be relevant and can, can explain gender differences. Regarding the sexual gap, it seems that the test for competition offer a, a partial explanation for the observed sexual orientation in leadership intentions. We find that priming individuals to consider the competitive nature of politics has a strong negative effect on homosexuals' interest in the field experiment, while surprisingly we found that this effect goes positive in the online experiment. Why it's happened that? Probably pre previous research points out that gays are less attracted to competition than straight men, but lesbians are more attracted to competition than straight women. Why, which in this case of a labor market may lead to wage penalty for gays and a wage premium for lesbian women. In our case, the online experiment consisted 
of more lesbians than gays in relation to the field experiment, and maybe mainly this difference in, in homosexuals between the two experiments drive our results. And lastly, we, we must also take into account that the fact that our field experiment was with Greeks involved in the election process, while our online sample consi consi consisted of US citizens. And of course, we have big uh, heterogeneity coming from the countries, country specific attitudes and existing prejudices towards homosexuality seem to play an important role in shaming, shaping our homosexual participants' behavior. According to the social acceptance rankings of the LGBT plus community index, USA is on the top of the ranking table of developed countries with an increasing trend, while Greece is on the bottom with the exact the opposite way. So future research can try to analyze these aforementioned points in depth and isolate their, their effects. And it would be interesting to investigate whether homosexuals other psychological factors like self-confidence or self-esteem uh, towards typically stereotype masculine jobs or as is the public speaking can explain uh, the results that documented in this paper. We know again, we say that the non-response and self-selection bias may create concerns for the validity. And we did uh, this demographic t-test. We didn't find any statistical significant differences. Unfortunately, we cannot support uh, the same regarding the sexual orientation and personality traits differences of the sample of our sample and, and, the, and the population of the political parties. And concerning the online experiment, our sample in general follow the national distribution. Uh, although the online participants in our case were skewed a little bit towards higher education. Uh, of course, in order to avoid self-selection bias in our online environment, the offered weights or in, for participating in our task was in line with the browse policy of uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, some uh, references. Yes, this was all. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Evangelia, for this uh, great and sophisticated and very rich uh, uh, study. Uh, do we have any questions from uh, uh, our participants? Um, um, in your um, literature review at the end, you have concluded in the literature review that women have lower motivations to lead. Uh, did the literature, does the literature try to consider the determinants of this? Uh, that is, what are the determinants of lower motivation to lead? And do you believe that if we challenge those uh, determinants, we will experience different outcomes? Because, you know, we can approach uh, the case from a feminist approaches and we have to consider issues related to gender roles. We have to consider issues related to patriarchy. So that is, uh, should we consider that if, do, 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 do you have any reflection regarding these issues, how gender roles and mainly what are the determinants of the lower uh, motivations of women to lead and perhaps sexual minorities uh, lower motivations to lead? Yes. Um... We do not have many insights by the field, uh, by the field, by field experiments, but uh, from lab experiments, that it's more easily to isolate many, many things and to concentrate to a particular question. The main point here is that um, women uh, are more shy away about competitive environments. They don't want to go in and to to be competitive with men. Uh, mainly, we know that um, the whole answer here is rely on psychology. So that's why in the end I said that it would be great to have field experiments isolating many, many things and trying to concentrate to, to psychological factors. So the factors like self-esteem, factors like um, interaction between self-esteem and personality traits, even deeper. Uh, the, 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 the most, um, uh, I, for example, I have a paper in the similar way that uh, goes with mood, which is again a psychological factor. Uh, it seems that the psychology plays a very uh, key role in, in this kind of experiments, and uh, it can explain the, in a very big uh, degree uh, why we have these differences. Um, 
so I believe that this is this the, the future research must uh, must go in this way, and uh, this is uh, not a problem, but this is a, makes a little bit complex for these papers like this one because you don't know when to wh where to rely. You rely on psychology, you rely on behavioral experimental economics, you rely on feminist economics. So also this is a problem, and for us. Uh, that we try to see where to, to which the, it's the umbrella of these papers. Uh, nice. But in general, I believe that psychology, economic psychology, something like that, it may give answers in a very efficient way uh, about these gaps on sexual and uh, sexual and, gap, and gender gaps. Uh, nice, nice, nice. But because definitely uh, we have to consider issues in relation to endogeneity and how to handle issues in relation yes. to endogeneity whenever we examine uh, issues in relation to motivation, leadership, gender roles, uh, women's rights. Uh, in your data, the data set you have information on the person on the big five personality traits. Um, what about uh, if we try to compare uh, heterosexuals with uh, sexual minorities? Are there differences in personality? Traits. Uh, yes. in, in your regression, in your regression, you have included information regarding the personality traits. Yes. Ha, ha, however, if, if we just consider the, the statistics, are there differences uh, on the big five personality traits? All in all, all in all. That is, are yes. there any differences? Yes. Also, I, I include that in the paper. Uh, we have differences that these some differences that we find they are uh, in uh, in uh, in line with uh, the literature using survey data from waves from uh, surveys. Uh, so the and also we have differences in the in the honesty levels of uh, homosexuals and heterosexuals. It seems that homosexuals are more more uh, more more close to the truth. Let's say that. Uh, how did you? How did you measure this? I believe that you have uh, utilized the validated index in order to, me to, to measure trust, honesty, because there's a big discussion in the literature. How yes, to... yes, yes. First of all, I would like to say to you that regarding the personality traits, uh, we find several differences between uh, uh, males and females. For example, neuroticism, uh, the females have higher levels of neuroticism regarding heterosexuals and homosexuals. We find that homosexuals have a higher level of neuroticism, but lower level of extraversion and openness. So this somehow um, uh, it justifies some behavioral pattern patterns. Regarding the honesty, uh, as I uh, said, it was not, I guess, very clear because it was this guy that going was uh, changing my slides. In the beginning, I had uh, this um, uh, addition uh, task when uh, the, the individuals participating in the experiments, they were doing a simple uh, addition of numbers. And in the end, uh, the system was informing them of their percentage of correct answers. And in the end of the experiment, we conceptualized that with Cantax um, uh, uh, risk uh, lying aversion uh, task. And we said that, okay, now imagine that you are a candidate and uh, you should um, uh, you should communicate your uh, clear message to your voters uh, within your performance in the addition task. So, which one, which which message would you sorry, choose? Sorry, about? guys, uh, we we are running out of time. Seriously, uh, yeah. we mm -hmm. should we should come to the end now of, to this of, of this talk because there is only uh, ten minutes left, so to speak. Yes. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So really quick, really quick, I calculated the distances between the performance and the message uh, that the candidate was choosing. And this, this, this distance was giving how, lie, how many lies you are saying from uh, the truth. Nice, nice, nice. Thank you, thank, thank you, thank you, Evangela. And I believe that in your paper you have included also information regarding the political values of each person and the orientation of the political of party. Nice. So we nice. control for all of that. Yes. Nice, nice, nice. So can I share my presentation now? And hopefully we don't have any, you know, any issue from an external. Uh, yes. Nice. Can you see my screen? Yes, can yes you we can see it. Uh, so nice. Well, uh, I will present now a recent study of mine, which was published in the journal Population Economics in 2022. The study is a straightforward meta-analysis of earning differences based 
structural orientation. Uh, in 2015, in 2015, um, Kleiter offered the first meta-analysis of sexual orientation and earnings on papers published between 1995 and 2012, covering the period between 1989 to 2007. Uh, Kleiter mainly focused on gay men and lesbian women. My study contributes to the literature by providing outcomes on earned differences for four sexual orientation groups. Mainly, we have gay men, we have lesbian women, we have bisexual men and bisexual women. In my study, I focus on papers published between 2012 and 2020, and the sample covers the period between 1991 and 2000. In. Hence, my study covers a wider period, helping to evaluate whether the last decade since 2010, uh, there was a change in earning uh, patterns based on sexual orientation. Uh, my previous studies, uh, my past research has found that between 90, 1989 to 2014, gay men tended to experience earning penalties compared with heterosexual uh, men. Uh, for gay men, as Doris said, employment penalties might be the result from the states and uncertainties regarding their credentials. Now, regarding lesbian women, based on my past studies, on average, lesbian women experience higher income than comparable heterosexual women. And through Doris' presentation, we had the opportunity to observe uh, some uh, reasons. The literature indicates that if women, if lesbian women invest more time uh, in uh, market-oriented human capital by staying more in school, as well as by choosing a major that leads to higher income, then such choices can influence their workplace outcomes. Now, why do we need, why do we need a new meta-analysis. Recent studies from the US, from Britain, as well as from Canada, utilizing data set after 2010, found that gay men can experience higher or the same earnings as uh, comparable heterosexual men. Moreover, studies from Britain, as well as studies from Australia, again, utilizing data, data set after 2010, found that lesbian women can experience lower or the same earnings as comparable heterosexual women. With Klaus in our special issue in the International Journal of Manpower, we have indicated that although an improvement in gay men's earnings is welcome, it may give an erroneous signal in countries where socio-political changes still do not favor gay men. Additionally, we have evaluated in our special issue that the assigned lower earnings for lesbian women require attention. Uh, it remains quite puzzling to observe that lower earnings for lesbian women might have taken place in time of social progress. So, all in all, in the present study, I was keen to examine, based on available evidences, whether since 2010, gay men and bisexual people have experienced lower earning penalties, in addition to determining whether lesbian women tend to experience more smaller earning uh, premiums. Um, regarding the sample, uh, I have followed a strict uh, protocol for meta-analysis. English language papers published between 2012 and 2020 were utilized. Um, I, have, uh, I have searched the, the literature with the following keywords, sexual orientation, LGB, gay, lesbian, bisexual, regression, earning wages and income. Estimate uh, estimates on full sample uh, sizes were preferred. However, papers reporting estimates per period, per sector, and per earning uh, classification formed part of the sample. All estimates are informed for basic demographic characteristics such as age and education. And uh, again, following a strict uh, protocol, at the end of the process, the meta-analysis sample consists of 29 estimates uh, um, for gay men, 24 estimates for lesbian women, uh, 13 estimates for bisexual men, and nine estimates for bisexual women. Uh, in terms of regions, in terms of region, 30% of the estimates are from the US, 
followed by 20% from Canada, 16% from uh, Australia, 13% uh, from the UK, and the remainder from European countries. In addition, 13% uh, uh, of uh, the estimates captured periods after 2010. Uh, in half of the cases, questions on same-sex living arrangements captured sexual orientation, and the remainder used questions on sexual behavior and self-identification. Uh, in the study, in the paper, I report a funnel plot to examine publication bias. Publication bias takes place when papers with uh, statistically significant results prove more likely to publish than studies with non-significant results. As we can imagine, publication bias can lead to meta-analysis that incorporate incomplete empirical evidence and generate summary results potentially biased towards favor favorable uh, treatment effects. Uh, the finding shows that the estimates have scattered either side of the overall effect line symmetrically, so there is no publication bias. In the paper, I have provided additional tests in order to evaluate the issue. Now I present, I will present six forest uh, plot. The meta-analyzed earning differences are presented on its uh, on its plot uh, with a dust vertical red line and the diamond at the end, the diamond at the bottom of the forest plots shows the point estimate by combining and averaging all the individual's estimates. The first plot, in the first plot, we have gay men. Uh, the first plot indicates that gay men's earnings were 6.8, 6.8% lower than the earnings of comparable heterosexual men. Uh, now, uh, regarding lesbian women, as we can see, all in all, lesbian women experience higher earnings as compared to heterosexual women. Uh, lesbian women, all in all, earned 7.1 higher earnings than comparable heterosexual women. In the third, uh, in the third uh, forest plot, we have uh, bisexual men. And as we can see, all in all, bisexual men experiences lower uh, earnings as compared to heterosexual men, approximately 10.3 lower wages. And in the fourth case, uh, we have earnings for bisexual women. Again, as we can see for bisexual women, all in all, they experience uh, 5.1 lower wages as compared to heterosexual women. We have two additional cases to consider. In the fifth case, uh, we have a new forest plot analysis based on studies utilizing uh, data sets after 2010. Uh, and we have information regarding gay men, bisexual men, and bisexual women. Due to limited observations, I had to pull gay men, bisexual men, and bisexual women. The analysis indicates that after 2010, gay men, bisexual men, and bisexual women earnings were 4% lower than the earnings of comparable heterosexual people. And again, the difference is uh, statistically significant at the 10% point. Moreover, in the sixth case, in the sixth case, uh, I have um, a further forest plot uh, for lesbian women. And this um, case indicates that uh, lesbian women experience 5.5% higher earnings than heterosexual women after 2010. So the outcomes based on the forest plot shows that in recent data sets, gay men, bisexual men, and bisexual uh, women continue to experience uh, lower earnings than heterosexual people, and lesbian women continue to receive higher earnings than heterosexual women. Uh, and then I the metarigration, then I have the metarigration, uh, the metarigration outcomes. In the first table, I present the metarigration results for gay men. We have three models to consider. The third model is the is the most informed. Um, in model three, uh, it is found that after 2010, after 2010, 
after 2010, uh, the earning penalties against gay men is 6.2 percentage point smaller than before 2010. Uh, the second table uh, indicates present the metarigration results for lesbian women in model one, two, and three. As we can observe, time period period doesn't moderate lesbian women's earning premiums. In the third table, in the third table, we have information for bisexual men and for bisexual women. Again, due to limited observations, I had to pull the various um, demographic characteristics. Uh, the most informed specification, the third specification, indicates that after 2010, uh, bisexual people faced a lower earning penalty uh, by approximately uh, 13.6 percentage point that before 2010. In the paper, I have a four of uh, specification. For instance, here we have a new table. In the new table, I pull observation for all sexual orientation, uh, sexual orientation minority groups, and I restrict the sample to studies capturing uh, periods pre-2010 and post-2010. All models found uh, that time period doesn't moderate gay men, bisexual men, and bisexual women's earning penalty. So all in all, according to the meta-regression outcomes, some estimates, some specifications indicate that after 2010, gay men and bisexual men and women experience lower earning penalties than before 2010. However, these patterns uh, did not prove robust, offering a variety of empirical specification didn't always verify that in more recent data set, gay men and bisexual men and women were better off in terms of a reduction in earning penalties. As we said, in the literature, as we said in uh, the literature, the patterns are quite mixed. Some recent UK studies and US studies indicating that gay men's stronger earning records might be the result from the improvement in attitudes towards sexual orientation minorities over the past decade, as well as there are some evidences indicating that gay men's earning penalties have reduced the last decade um, due to anti-discrimination legislation. However, in the same time, in the same time, there are evidences from the US as well as from Canada indicated that little evidence exists that gay men's earning penalties have reduced the last decade. According to our review with uh, Klaus, as well as uh, based on Dory's work, despite new labor legislation against discrimination in the labor market, people who have a minority sexual orientation experience higher, higher hiring discrimination, lower job satisfaction, more bullying, more harassment, lower wages and higher poverty than heterosexual people. So to conclude, all in all, uh, between 1991 and 2018, gay men, bisexual men and bisexual women experience lower earnings than comparable heterosexual people. On the other hand, lesbian women earnings were higher compared to the earnings of heterosexual women. After 2010, gay men and bisexual men and women continue to experience earning penalties, while lesbian women continue to experience earning premiums. After two, uh, 2010, a reduction in earning penalties for gay men and bisexual people might be present. However, the pattern should not present a robust outcome because it wasn't proven in alternative empirical specification. In the paper, uh, I have presented several cases to consider. That hence, uh, the study concludes by indicating that the persistence of earning penalties for gay men, bisexual men and women in the face of anti-discrimination policies represent a critical uh, problem. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Do we have any uh, question? Uh, Nick, Nick, we are running out of time. We need to have a, a break. Uh, so maybe we conclude here with the paper and maybe a few sentences, but short about the handbook. And okay, 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 okay. Yes. Uh, just a minute. Just a minute to share again my screen. Okay. Okay. I will not need more than two minutes. Where is it? 
So, so nice, 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 nice. Um, we can continue with the final task of this uh, session, with the final task of this session. Uh, since gender, sexual orientation, gender identity. I'm truly happy of the GLO cluster on gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, and labor market outcomes. This GLO cluster aims to provide evaluation of labor practices and policies aiming at a higher degree of knowledge and inclusion for gender, gender identity, and sexual orientation minorities. We, class, we have edited special issues in journals on the subject matter. In addition, GLO and Springer Nature set up a partnership aiming to produce an innovative live reference handbook consisting of 24 books or sections the title Handbook of Labor, Human Resources, and Population Economics. Klaus is the editor. I was appointed the section editor for gender. The gender section or the gender book consists of 18 chapters found online, which are updated early. This gender book evaluates the global labor market in the context of gender, sexual orientation, and gender identity equality, and the associated policies and regulations to recommend actions for establishing equality. The book evaluates the constraints that women, sexual and gender identity minorities experience, as well as some of the workplace policies that moderate their realities. Uh, the authors evaluate the connections among stereotypes, discrimination, and the global labor markets, and provide recommendations. Today, Doris, as well as Katerina, presented their surveys. We have secured unique contributions examining the association between gender stereotypes, gender roles, masculinity, femininity, and workplace outcomes. In addition, we have extremely important contribution on gender gaps in education, gender wage gaps. We have contributions on gender financial crisis and precarious labor. Also, we have a plethora of papers on trans people's labor market realities, as well as on the economics of sexual orientation on minorities. The book should be very helpful for university students, as well as for researchers examining labor and population economics. I would like to thank the authors, as well as Klaus, for the opportunity to allow me uh, to form uh, the gender cluster and edit the gender section. So, Klaus, would you like to intervene and offer some uh, reflections regarding our, uh, our uh, your handbook and the gender section? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Nick, I think uh, it's sufficient at this time now to just summarize and say, yes, this is a, a, a very challenging and uh, and and uh, forthcoming uh, handbook uh, also i mean it's 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 a project online first and it will be also physically available at some time now um, we are still in the process to to complete a number of chapters but we regularly post and uh, send uh, uh, chapters to a wider audience as followers of the glo have uh, i think realized at the same time as the editor of the journal of population economics i would like to stress that uh, uh, this topic in general, gender identity, has been with us since long, but also uh, recently we have published a few articles, as you have seen. So we will continue doing this, of course, only if the contributions are innovative and high academic quality. Okay, thank you. With, with these remarks, uh, I will, would like to thank also Nick and uh, the, all the speakers uh, for and the discussions for presentations and uh, comments. We have to close now because we're on a on a on a total force uh, through three days, twenty four hours, so to speak. Uh, we need a, a, a short break. Uh, we will reconvene at uh, three three o'clock, uh, fifteen uh, zero zero hours uh, Berlin time. This means in uh, less than twenty twenty minutes. You can come in earlier. I mean, you can stay also. Uh, that's not a problem. It's like in a physical room. Enjoy. Uh, it's a short break, uh, and I will be back in time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you for your attention. Thank you for your contribution. Enjoy the rest of the conference and enjoy the Christmas break. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for your contribution.